Um, thank you to Virginia McLeod and the Vancouver Island Regional Library for inviting us to participate in this program today. It's really nice to see people again. <laughs> we haven't seen people in a while. Um, my name is Sonia Nicholson. I am the archivist at the Saanich Pioneer Society. Um, for about the last two-ish years, I started just before COVID, um, and we have another paid employee who is our digitization technician, and other than that, it's all volunteers, um, and they've been doing this work for a really long time, some, some really great work, so I was, I was so excited that they asked me to come on board and, and join the team. Um, now, all volunteers have not returned since COVID. That's been a challenge. And we're always looking for more people to get involved. So as things open up, if you're interested, please do reach out um, because there's, there's lots to do. There's always lots to do. So um, yeah, please let us know. Uh, the archives is open by appointment only. And um, we're open Mondays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I know that's pretty limited, but that's all we're able to do. Uh, with what we have. Um, but you know, you can always email or phone. And you know, we're happy to to look into some things for you as well. Now, um, the Saanich Pioneer Society operates a museum and archives. And they're both on the site, the former site of the Saanich Fairgrounds. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so that's the Log Cabin Museum and it's built in 1933. It was the location of the first district of Central Saanich Council meeting and was their location for their meetings for the first year until they had their own hall. And it's the oldest purpose-built museum still in operation in Western Canada. Uh, it was always a gathering place for families who settled in the area. Uh, I like to think of it as the community living room. Um, and uh, many bridge games and especially cribbage games were played there. Next slide, please. And we normally host events such as our popular talk and tea. That's the first picture there is the last talk we had actually in February 2020 before we closed. And seasonal events like Christmas in the cabin. That's the second photo. Um, a strawberry social was also really popular. Uh, unfortunately, we've been closed throughout the pandemic due to health and safety challenges and also a much needed structural renovation. We received a Canadian Heritage Infrastructure Grant, um, and it's doing some structural, uh, much needed structural work in the cabin, which is nearly done. So we're hoping to be able to reopen soon. Uh, the archives has been open right through COVID um, by appointment only or virtually. So we're carrying on. Uh, next slide, please. So right next door to the Log Cabin Museum, and this is in Saanichton, for those who aren't aware on the peninsula, we're in Saanichton, right behind the Thrifty Foods. So the Log Cabin is there and the archives building is right next door to the Log Cabin and it's uh, Polo Park Crescent is the street, just off East Saanich Road. The archives building was built in 1967 and that was built with a centennial grant. And it was originally intended to be just a basic building to be the Historic Artifacts Museum. Well, it quickly became obvious that we didn't have the space for large items like farm vehicles. And so these went to the new Historical Artifacts Society, which was created you know, for this purpose. So this building was originally really basic, concrete block, no individual rooms, no utilities, really cold, uh, because it was just meant to be storage. So at that time, I mean, and even before that, the Saanich Pioneer Society always collected archival materials, but the organization of those materials really got going about 1990 um, with the first archivist who was Lorette Agnew. Did a lot of that initial work that I'm still trying to build on today. Um, and when the agricultural hall, part of the Saanich Fairgrounds was destroyd by fire in the 1990s. The cladding from that building was saved and actually used on the exterior of the archives building. So you can see it there. The current version of this building didn't come about until 2003. And I mean, light and plumbing and all of those wonderful things. Uh, until that point, all of the archival material had been stored in one room in the log cabin. So it was very cramped. Uh, this is much better. Next slide, please. 
So I'm focusing a lot on the archives. That's because that's the area that I focus on. That's the area I work in. Um, the president of the society, Susan Myers Co., who may or may not be here today, um, she does a lot of work on the museum side of things and on the archives things and, and just managing the whole uh, society. So uh, I will focus more on what I know best, which is the archives. This, what you're looking at now in this photo is the reference room. And this is the main room that you'll see when you come into the archives. And it's where you'll be able to view archival material and reference material. If you let us know your research topic in advance, then we can have material ready for you. You know, just give us a heads up and we'll pull things out and, and have all kinds of show and tell material ready for you when you come in. Um, we will ask you to sanitize and sign in and then you can get started. And there's lots of space at the work tables. It looks, you know, maybe a little bit full there because we have stuff out to show, um, but there's a lot of space to, to come and spread out and work. And currently we're only booking one researcher at a time. So you don't have to worry about crowds. Um, things to bring, please do bring uh, a laptop, a camera, a notebook, a pencil. Archives are a pencil free or a pen free zone for those who may not know. Um, some cash for photocopies if you're wanting that, but you can take pictures instead. That's totally fine too. And until rules change, we ask that you bring your mask as well. Um, don't bring food, coffee, pens, uh, but a water bottle is okay. So some of the do's and don'ts of coming to visit the archives. Now this reference room underwent a reorganization about a year and a half ago to make it a more user-friendly space for volunteers and society members and, and visitors. Um, so it's been, it's worked out really well. Some new shelving, one of our volunteers built some shelving for us and we've just been reorganizing things. So it's great improvement. Um, and when you visit, and you can't see it in this picture, but you'll see a table just off to the left-hand side. Uh, and that's our accessioning or processing area in this room uh, where you'll see recently donated items that are going to be cataloged by volunteers. And that actual, that table is said to be the original council table. Can't verify that, but supposedly it's the original council table. And um, we also have a reference library, which you can see in that photo uh, with books on local and BC history. Next slide, please. Now I did say I was going to focus on archives, but there's a lot of overlap between archives, the archive side and the museum side. It's not like the two sides work in isolation. And we do have an artifacts room within that archives building. And artifacts can supplement archival research and help tell the story that, you know, that you're working on. The majority of artifacts are on display in the log cabin by theme. This artifacts room serves as overflow and extra storage for us. We also have what we call the shed, uh, which is immediately outside the archives building. And that's storage for larger items like farm implements, furniture, that sort of thing. We've got a Got all kinds of things, you know, butter churns and uh, sleighs. Uh, we weren't, we aren't able to accept very large items such as machinery and heritage acres on the highway is a more suitable home for that type of thing. Uh, but our artifacts room includes oversized archival material, framed paintings, art, photographs, photograph collections, maps. Um, so just included just a sample of the types of artifacts that we have on hand for your research. And you can see in that first picture that, you know, combine artifacts such as the metal, you know, with archival photos, documents, and it tells a story of, of in this case, the Brether family of Philip Brether. Next slide, please. So in the same building, um, in the archives building, there's also what we call the archives room. And most archival records are stored here. And most of our records are organized by either family or institution slash subject. Next slide. Uh, for example, the Brether family or railroads. And I think I've got, uh, this picture is of some of the family files that we have. And if you're looking for a particular family or a particular institution, you're wondering if you have anything before you come in, you can just send us an email and say, hey, do you have a file on 
you know, the Thompson family or the Brether family. And we'll have a look for you and we'll let you know if it's like a really skinny file or if there's kind of a decent amount of stuff, we'll give you a sense of what is in our collections. Next slide, please. So there is, for example, the Moore and Brether collection, which is like six boxes, I think, on the shelf and um, there's all kinds of things. I just opened one of the boxes as a sample. Next slide. So there's examples of the type of material you might find in some of these boxes. And there's all kinds of goodies in there. It could be reference material, newspaper clippings, it could be certificates, it could be correspondence. So there's a real, a real mix once you dive in. Next slide. So we do have a digitization program, um, which is ongoing. We have thousands of photographs that have been digitized. Unfortunately, they're not available online at this time. And that is at the top of our wish list. It's something I'd really like to see. We're not there yet. And it's it's really a lack of resources, to be honest. You know, it's labor, it's costs, um, the software to do it. So we'd love to do it. We're not able to, uh, but we can find images for you if you're looking for something in particular. Um, and then you can order up to 10 high resolution images for $10, it's a nominal fee. Um, yeah, so just let us know, we'll see if we have anything. And I have some more samples here in the pictures of things that we have. So, you know, searching through the vertical files or collections can lead you to other sources within what we have in our collections and even to other archives such as Sydney uh, or some of our other archives friends around Greater Victoria. And, you know, we're just happy to help you with your research, you know, just let us know kind of what, what your aim is and what you're looking for and we'll direct you as best we can, even if it's, uh, if the materials may be elsewhere and, and not with us. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, we've been doing some other activities and, and other services, and especially over the last two years. Uh, you know, pre-COVID, we were starting to get some momentum on school and group visits. Uh, something I'd started going after when I when I started this position. Um, but virtual is also available too. Um, we've done a virtual tour for a group of archivists, which was kind of fun. And actually on Monday, I'm gonna be doing a virtual presentation similar to this one for a group of students. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Black History Month as well. So, so that should be fun too. So we do offer that for all kinds of groups and it's really, it's by donation, it's uh, minimal fee. We'd certainly appreciate any donations, but um, yeah, no, we're happy to do to do group things either in person or, or virtual. Um, we've also in the meantime, you know, during COVID done a number of online exhibits slash blog posts, uh, and those have been quite popular and it allows us to do a deeper dive into specific stories. Uh, there was one on a story from Brentwood Bay, the Spencer family and what came from these mystery uh, negatives that that we had in the archives that are no longer a mystery and it's it's a sad story but also a really interesting story so uh, yeah have a look at that it's it's on our website uh, we also became more active on social media so we have Facebook Twitter Instagram um, and have been sharing all kinds of things from our collections there so again we don't have our photos online but we're trying to share things in in other ways uh, we've also been working over the last couple of years since I've come on um, on building partnerships and relationships within the community. For example, this one with the Vancouver Island Regional Library. We've also worked with the Greater Victoria Public Library and done a couple of on-site exhibits at the Central Saanich branch uh, with the opportunity, which we haven't done yet, to maybe move exhibits to other branches as well. Um, we've also been working with the District of Central Saanich uh, we've talked about a, a new collaboration or project to do with the Newman Farm and maybe an oral history project, although hasn't really taken off yet, but we've talked about doing that. So I'm hoping that that's still going to happen. Uh, we've also worked with them on doing photo wraps for utility boxes and getting archival photos out into the public in, in another way. So that's kind of kind of neat. Haven't seen any yet, but I know we've been talking to them about it and sending them some pictures. Um, and something else we've done is community organizations and events, you know, working with, uh, for example, Go By Bike Week 2020. So they asked us for some pictures to do with cycling, 
which we provided and they had at their event. Um, and then working with societies on specific projects. There was a society that came to us and is, was doing a project around railroads. So we helped them with some railroad history, peninsula railroad history, that sort of thing. So we welcome that, you know, any kind of community partnership or, you know, working together to put on an exhibit somewhere, that sort of thing. Um, so just to wrap up here, uh, you know, there's a rich history on the Saanich Peninsula and there are a number of organizations working on preserving and sharing that history. And there is overlap, there is definitely overlap, but we, we work together, you know, we're, we're all friends. Um, and ultimately we just wanna help you with your research. So uh, we welcome that. So thank you. And I'll take questions at the end, I guess, but that's my part for now. Thank you. Sorry, and I'll unpin you. That was amazing, Sonia. Thanks so much for introducing us to the great work that's happening at the Saanich Pioneer Society. Um, okay. Remove, and then Sydney. Hi. We're gonna pin you up at the top here, if I can. Thanks for bearing with me through this. There is a learning curve to all this virtual world. You're doing fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for being kind to everybody. Okay, we've got Sydney pinned and ready to go. So I'll just hand it right over to you. All right, so I'm just going to share my screen. You can see. Okay, Virginia, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you see everything? Yeah, all right, great. Well, then I will get started. Uh, first off, thank you, Virginia, for inviting me to talk. And thank you, Sonia, for going first. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, so like Virginia says, uh, my name is Sydney, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Sydney Museum. So yes, I am Sydney in Sydney. And yes, I promise you I've heard every possible version of that joke by now. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, the Sydney Museum and Archives is located in Sydney on Beacon Avenue between 4th and 5th Streets. Oh, we're in the basement of the old post office building, which you can see here. We are, oh, sorry, we're right below Roger's Chocolates, just to where the little arrow is pointing. Uh, we are currently open seven days a week from 10 till 4, but we're doing timed admission right now. So if you want to come in, it's best to book your time online. And the archives is actually off site and it's by appointment. So if you have any archival questions, uh, please send an email to archives at sydneymuseum.ca and Adrian, our fantastic archivist, will be happy to help you out. Now we've been in our current location since 2000, but the Sydney Museum has actually been around for 51 years. There we go. Uh, we were established in 1971 with the mandate to acquire, preserve, and make available the heritage, culture, and interests of the Saanich Peninsula. So given this mandate, our permanent exhibits and our artifact and archival collections all focus on the history of Sydney and North Saanich. But when it comes to our temporary exhibits, we like to mix it up, and we've definitely had a lot of different exhibitions over the years. We've had exhibits on money on teapots, on local fabric art guilds, local painting groups, book binding, watering cans, and of course our annual Lego brick exhibition which is currently on at the museum until the end of March and this is actually its 16th year. So you really never know what you're going to get into at the Sydney Museum. We definitely like to have our fun. Now, over the past couple of years, we've had quite a few changes happening at the Sydney Museum, which I think given the pandemic and everything happening, uh, quite a few folks in our community may have missed out on. So I figured this would be a great chance to catch everyone up on what's been happening, starting with our renovations. So recently, the Sydney Museum has undergone a pretty intense makeover. In 2021, we were granted a least amount of money from Heritage BC and the government of BC to completely redo our floors. And uh, this was really necessary for a couple of reasons. Uh, first off, our carpets were old. They just need to be replaced. It happens. Uh, two, our floors were actually quite uneven. As I mentioned, our museum has been in the basement of the old post office building for 20 years. 
And we've, we've grown in those years, things have changed. But as we expanded, we took out some walls, changed up some rooms. And that combined with just general wear and tear, and we ended up with a floor that had some pretty noticeable dips and wasn't the safest to walk across. So we had to fix that. And three, underneath some of that carpet was actually the original concrete floor from the 1930s when the post office building was built. And it needed some care in order to preserve that piece of Sydney heritage. So excitingly, we got the grant and at the end of May, 2021, we closed our doors for three months and completely renovated the museum. It was quite a project. We had to pack up and move everything. And I do mean everything. We had exhibits, cases, artifacts, furniture, our entire front desk set up, a piano, a tractor, uh, and a large plastic cow. We really moved absolutely everything. And it wasn't like we had an offsite storage space to move this to. We had to keep everything in the museum. So basically we were packing everything up and safely shuffling it around as the contractors were redoing the floor and everything else as we went. So there were several days where staff just moved objects from one side of the room to another. It was what had to be done. And we ended up with a really fantastic looking museum. Um, but I can safely say I never want to move a cow again. Um, it was definitely necessary though. It was a great chance to not only improve our accessibility, but also change up our layout, layout pardon me, and refresh some of our older exhibits. We actually now have a kitchen display that shows both a 1920s and 1940s kitchen side by side. So it's pretty neat. So if you haven't been into the city museum for a while, I really encourage you to come by. It definitely looks quite different from what you'll remember. Now, like I said, this was a lot of work, but it was definitely necessary. And we've even updated our train table to be completely made out of Lego now. So you can see that behind staff, this was our reopening day. It's quickly becoming a community. <laughs> So that's the big news for the front of the museum, but we've had plenty happening behind the scenes as well. Uh, in 2020, we undertook a project to completely reorganize our collection space according to the internationally recognized reorg standard. Now, reorg is a method for planning, storing, and preserving museum collections based on the tools and space already available in your institution. And uh, while over the years, our collections had been very well taken care of by staff and volunteers, we were simply due for an update. So here we have our before and after photos of our storage space. Uh, before is the one with the brown boxes and after is everything is all white shiny shelves and everything. So I'm not gonna go into all of the steps of the REARG protocol because it's a lot, but the gist is we had to take everything apart, put in new shelves, repack all of our artifacts and reorganize them all. So. Again, a lot of work, but we ended up with a project, pardon me, we ended up with a collection that is as safe as it can be from hazards and deterioration. It's organized and it's accessible. So this is really great for the staff and volunteers who work with this collection, but mainly it's fantastic for the collection itself. This is really great for its long-term stability and ensuring that all of the artifacts we're caring for will be around for years to come and for future generations to enjoy. Now also, and perhaps this is the most useful bit of information for any local historians watching, uh, the City Museum has partnered with the Peninsula News Review and the BC History Digitization Project to complete the first phase of our Peninsula News Review Digitization Project, uh, with the end product being a searchable online database of all the issues of the Peninsula News Review from 1912 to 2002. It's quite a while now, but our has held physical copies of the issues of the PNR from 1912 to present with microfilm versions of the issues from 1912 to 2002. Now there is a ton of history preserved on these issues. The PNR has kept everyone in our community informed about local events, accidents, births, deaths, agricultural news, you name it, it's in the PNR. But until now, it has been really it's been a challenge for a member of the public to access this treasure trove of local history. So like I said, our archive is only accessible by appointment. So there's a bit of a barrier there. 
but also the print copies of the newspaper are incredibly delicate. I mean, some of them are over a hundred years old, so we can't really allow a lot of handling. It's just not good for the newspapers, which leaves the microfilm, which once again, you have to be there in person. So that same barrier. Um, but once you're here, you have to look through the reels and reels of stuff on this. This is the museum's one and only microfilm reader. Uh, staff have a bit of a love, hate, begrudging respect relationship with this thing. Uh, we affectionately call it the dinosaur, but it's it's massive. Uh, it's not very user friendly, but it does get the job done. So, I mean, it serves its purpose. Uh, but with the completion of phase one of this project, all of our microfilm has been digitized and is now publicly searchable in our new database which you can access from our website as well as from the bc history digitization program site i've actually made a tutorial on how to use this database which you can see on the sydney museum's youtube page if you want a little bit more details on that so we're not quite done with the digitization. Uh, as I said earlier, we only have microfilms for issues from 1912 to 2002, but having all these reels in searchable means our community now has access to approximately 3,800 issues of the PNR. So there's a lot of newspapers for people to look through. And our next step is to begin digitizing the printed copies so that we can complete the 100 years of history on this database. But for now, please enjoy everything we have up and ready to go. Now, this isn't the only exciting news for our researchers. Uh, recently, we've been approved to spend some time and money digitizing some of our larger archival documents. This means maps, tapestries, aerial photographs, and even works of art. This is really exciting because some of these documents have fantastic information on them. We have really old maps, really large old maps that can tell you some amazing stuff about Sydney but we also have stuff like this tapestry. Now this tapestry was made by students at McTavish Elementary School in 1958, and it shows the approximate locations of the European settlers on the Saanich Peninsula in the late 1800s. And while I wouldn't go using this as your uh, <laughs> most concrete source of information, it is actually surprisingly accurate. So having things like this digitized and accessible to the public will be fantastic. And also it's great for the preservation of the documents. Less handling means they last longer. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't briefly mention what's next for the Sydney Museum. We're really excited about our next two exhibits. Uh, first, in April 2022, we have the suitcase project opening. Uh, it's coming from the Nikkei National Museum in Burnaby, BC. It is a multimedia exhibition of Japanese Canadians during World War II and the continuing impact of this injustice. And then following that in summer 2022, we are welcoming 100 years of the little black dress from the Costume Museum in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So we have a lot to look forward to. So thank you all so much for listening. Uh, before I completely wrap up, I just want to say a huge thank you to the Sydney Museum's fantastic team of volunteers. We only have three staff members, so much like the log cabin, we are very much dependent on our volunteers. None of the projects that I have mentioned would be possible without them. And of course, we are all also always looking for more. So if you'd be interested in joining, check out our website, please let me know. Uh, but that's it for me. So thank you all.